It's 10 o'clock on Wednesday, the 2nd of February, 2022. A warm welcome to 2022 and U3A Helderberg. Good morning to you all from here in Somerset West, especially our non helderberg visitors today. I'm Richard Tompkins, your host for the presentation. We are thanks to our studio director today, Derek Van Eerden, who is coordinating proceedings. We're presenting these talks on YouTube. A reminder that we cannot hear or see you but there's a live chat area on the right hand side of your screen where questions to the speaker can be typed during the presentation. Today we'll select those of your questions that could be of general interest to all and show them centrally on everyone's screen. The full presentation is being recorded and will be available along with previous ones from last year on our website, which is u3helderberg.co.za. Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Leonard Saransky. South African born, but tertiary education overseas into ALIA in international relations. He's designed games and simulations in academic, corporate and public sectors. Current interests include developmental issues, poverty alleviation, identity politics and conflict and crisis management in the Middle East and Southern Africa. He's authored many papers on these and other topics. Probably biggest recent accolade is his election to the chair of U3A Atlantic Seaboard. So I'm not too sure whether to congratulate him or commiserate. Dr. Saransky's talk today is entitled Climate Change. Are we reaching the end of the road? Sounds quite a question with no obvious answer and therefore a challenge. And on that note, over to Dr. Saransky. Thank you very much, Richard, and I'm delighted to be talking to the Helderberg U3A. I've heard such great things about you. Now, let me say outright that I am not a scientist. I used to be called a political scientist, but that was also a wrong term because politics is not a science. It's more of an art if at its best. So I got interested in this. Uh, pretty much because of what I saw happening around me in the world. Um, it's rained rather than snowed in Greenland, in Greenland this last year. Canada has uh, a 50 degree centigrade in a village in British Columbia. Death Valley in California reached 54.4. Um, a month's rainfall fell in China in a few hours. You've probably not seen that the EU has had flooding problems in several countries and costing billions in losses. Uh, drought in, 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 in subtropical Africa, uh, Latin America, sea levels up, blah, 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 and goes on. Uh, and here in Cape Town, I'm not sure how it is out there uh, in your neck of the woods, but we've had an unusually hot summer. And this is my cat who is uh, trying to, to graduate, uh, get a master's in climatology. But um, um, we've had a very hot summer. We had 40 degrees last weekend. I was in Stellenbosch yesterday. Uh, I'll tell you, I didn't want to be out there on the road. I looked for the shade. So I got interested in this, not as a scientist, but as a concerned layman. And I'm going to try and... Uh, cut down what was a five-part, two hours a time series into uh, less than an hour. So we need to understand, and I want to apologize, there are a lot of statistics here, and I do not like statistics normally, but uh, that's part of the game. So uh, a little bit of background about what greenhouse gases mean and, and, and what is going on. So our energy comes from the sun. We all know that. And some of the energy coming from the sun is reflected back uh, away from the earth. Some of it is absorbed in the sea, particularly, and in, in, in the earth. Um, so one third is reflected back, two thirds is absorbed. The problem being that because of the blanket that we put around the earth, there's a kind of blanket which, which is, in fact, the greenhouse gases preventing some of this uh, radiation from being um, sent back, uh, this heat radiation. Um, so the seas are getting warmer, 
and, uh, and, and so is the earth. So we call it the greenhouse effect. And the main, uh, the main, the main uh, uh, problem makers are CO2, carbon dioxide, methane, CH4, nitrous oxide, N2O, uh, which are warming the atmosphere and preventing the, the, the reflection back, uh, which, which was possible in earlier times. So it's really um, the industrial revolution and the use of fossil fuels, oil, coal, natural gas. Um, in the last hundreds of years, relatively, relatively rec recent, so we call those uh, carbon, uh, carbon uh, substances fossilized sunlight. So it, it is stuff that has been stored in the earth for millennia coming from the sun, and we have started using it in order to drive our in, in, industrial revolutions. Now, how do we know that uh, there's been a, a change in climate? Well, they look at lake sediments. They look at ice cores. So they dig down into icebergs a mile or two, pull out a little piece in which some air has been captured, and they and they examine that that air to see what level of uh, of, of uh, carbon dioxide is in the place. Um, I didn't know that there were huge huge ice sheets uh, around North America and Europe. Uh, not so long ago, three kilometers thick. Those parts of the world were totally covered in ice. And, of course, one of the problems that we're facing today is that some of that ice has started melting. And we've all seen uh, stories about uh, sn the snow bears being sort of uh, uh, isolated and unable to, 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 to do their normal thing. So we call this period that we're in the Holocene period, uh, which started 10,000 years ago. And in the last 4,000 years, temperatures have, have risen by 6%. Sea levels have risen by 120 meters. Carbon dioxide has gone up by one third and methane gas doubled. So now, why? How did this happen? Well, it started 7,000 years ago with deforestation, when we started farming, when we started agriculture, and the land clearance started the rise in the, the escape of carbon dioxide. And then 5,000 years ago, we introduced cattle and rice agriculture, and that led to uh, the methane gases. Uh, not a bad thing because all of that delayed a new ice age coming. So there's a good side of the story and a bad side of the story. But the, the real summary is that when we started measuring how many parts per million of, of, of gases are in the environment, pre-industrial 280 parts per million, in 1958, there were 360 parts per million, and today we believe we're around 420, 420 parts per million of CO2 uh, in the environment. So for the previous 800,000 years, we were averaging around 200, 280, and this has become the problem. Now, I started telling you where this comes from, from where, where does the pollution come from? mainly from fossil fuels and fossil fuels co2 and uh, methane etc come from energy production industrial processes transport and uh, a video that i'm going to show, show you shortly will give a little bit more detail about this humanity started really sitting up and taking notice in about 1988 34 years ago 
that's when the UN Environmental Panel started doing research on what was happening. And it probably was because there was a realization that uh, the climate was changing, the, the environment was changing, uh, there was more pollution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Al Gore comes to mind. He was the vice president, and in 2008 he got a Nobel Peace Prize, and he has been fighting for us to take notice about climate change since uh, the early 2000s. So we have uh, the industrial source for, for, for uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, the second major source is land use changes, cutting down forests, urbanization, building roads. Um, so uh, in, in this period, in the, in the recent last 40 years, there's been a 50% decline in Arctic ice. And uh, the temperatures since 1880 have gone up 1.1 degrees centigrade and oceans have risen 24 centimeters. Okay, so that's some background. And now, uh, Derek, can I ask you to show a small part of the video and we can send you more if you're interested uh, by email after after the, the, the lecture is over. Derek. The air we breathe has changed. The mix of gases is shifting with more and more greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide. And this shift is happening faster each year. In fact, concentrations of CO2 have reached levels never before breathed by humans since Homo sapiens evolved. In just a few hundred years, eons of fossilized sunshine have been burned as coal, oil, and gas. The exhaust has transformed the entire atmosphere and ocean. It's like a pollution blanket, and the result we know as climate change. So how much more of that fossilized sunshine can we burn before further destabilizing the Earth's systems? Not much. Think of it as a carbon budget. We are currently adding 55 billion metric tons of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere every year. This is the gigaton challenge. By some estimates, at that pace, we will have burned through the remaining budget by 2030. So to give us some room to breathe, the world must reduce greenhouse gas pollution by more than 7% each year, every year of this decade, starting now. There are a number of ways to do that. Let's start by looking at the greenhouse gases themselves. CO2 makes up nearly 75% of the pollution emitted each year. There's also nitrous oxide, known as laughing gas, but it's no laughing matter, seeping out of farm fields and elsewhere and making up 6% of the problem. And then there's methane, which you may also know of as natural gas. It's 17% of the total. There are other greenhouse gases, but these three make up the bulk of the climate challenge. All must be reduced and fast. Methane is better at trapping the sun's heat, which means cutting methane pollution is a necessary and fast-acting stimulus for our carbon budget. If methane emissions from agriculture and the oil and gas industry can be eliminated in this decade, we might be able to stave off catastrophes like the loss of the Arctic sea ice and glaciers all around the world. CO2 has a longer life. Once it is added to the atmosphere, it can stay up there for hundreds of years, if not longer. CO2 emissions must be cut in half by 2030, and then reduced even further by 2040 to put the world on a path of adding no more CO2 to the air by 2050. And that means transforming the modern world as quickly as possible. There are several ways to break down the sources of greenhouse gas emissions. Here, we're using the public Climate Watch data. Start with energy. The majority of modern energy comes from fossil fuels, which makes the energy sector 76% of the climate challenge, including the fuels used for transportation, industrial processes, and agricultural production. The shift to clean energy must be accelerated by an order of magnitude if we want any chance to restrain global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And we'll need more ways to store this clean electricity, whether that's putting it in the chemical bonds of a battery or into a molecule of hydrogen. 
Batteries and clean hydrogen are also going to play a key role in cleaning up transportation, which accounts for 17% of climate changing pollution, including the use of energy to move people and goods around. 8% from cars, 5% from trucks and other heavy duty vehicles, and 4% from shipping and aviation. With abundant clean electricity, the world can win the race to electrify cars and create cleaner alternative fuels for trucks, ships, and even one day, airplanes. Then there are our lifestyles and the materials that make them possible. That's everything from the cement and steel that go into buildings to the plastic fibers in fashion. All told, these materials account for 6% of our emissions, on top of the energy emissions required to produce them. And we'll need new and clean ways to make them or replace them. Farming and animal raising also have to change as agriculture accounts for 12% of greenhouse gas pollution. That means everything from how and what people eat to how and what cows, chickens, and pigs eat. It also means finding ways for farm fields to go from sources of greenhouse gas to places where okay, greenhouse Derek, gases get buried. Now. Thank you. Right, well, you can see the full video if you want later. I've got another two coming up. So, um... Part of what, what spurred me on to do this course uh, some months ago was COP26 in Glasgow. And I think this is the first of several every five-year COPs, the last previous one being Paris, uh, that was taken seriously by world leaders. For the first time, they were understanding that in their own countries, there had been forest fires, there had been floods, there had been heat waves, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So what happened at COP26? There was a pledge to try and stay at 1.5 degrees centigrade, even though in Paris five years earlier, they said, let's try for 1.5 uh, centigrade, but not go beyond two. Now, people who have examined the pledges at COP26 say that given the current pledges, and if the countries had pledged what they pledged, we would not stay at 1.5. We would go to 2.4. Now, if the weather that we've had here or elsewhere in the world at under 1.5, which may or may not be true, is as hot as it was, 2.4 is going to be unlivable. What do I mean by unlivable? It means that people would not be able to go outside to farm. They'd have to farm at night. It means that they would not be able to build uh, these huge buildings that we insist on continuing to build during the daylight. I have taught in Ghana for the last five, six years, and I have marveled at the way in which the builders are outside, stripped to the waist, building from eight in the morning till five in the afternoon, and I just don't know how they do it, because in Ghana, at the university I taught at, we had air conditioning right through the day and night. So CO2 will be cut. The most interesting one in a way was that there's a pledge to cut methane by 30%. And in that video, you would have heard her say that methane is more dangerous than CO2 in some ways. But unfortunately, China, Russia, and India haven't joined in on the methane issue. The other big issue at uh, COP26, and there were many, uh, and I urge you to go and, and look it up. It's very easy to, to capture what happened there. There was a commitment to phase down coal. Now, the phase down came at the last minute uh, rather than to phase out coal. India balked at the last minute and said they wouldn't sign the agreement, the final agreement, unless the wording was changed because... India is one of those countries like our own, which use uh, coal uh, to a tremendous uh, effect. And we, of course, have got our, our beloved Gwedi Mantashe, who uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, called out civil society for uh, undermining the possibility of getting gas and oil from the sea off the east coast of South Africa and said it was a kind of uh, conspiracy of uh, uh, similar to, to, to apartheid's uh, uh, system of a special kind, which is quite ridiculous. But 
there's no doubt that Gwedi has interests. We know that the ANC has shares in Shell, and that was a fight that was won. And in the end of this whole discussion, the only thing that's really going to save us is ourselves. Are we going to do anything personally to cut back? She said 7% per year. That means you and me. We, we are using more than we should be using. Are we going to do it? Will we do it? And if we don't, what are the consequences? Okay, so there was one other thing that I want to mention from COP26, and that was $1 trillion per annum was promised as a fund after 2025, when the current presidents and prime ministers will no longer be responsible, perhaps, um, to help the poorer nations to deal with their um, energy usage. Now, one can't hold too much faith in that because in Paris, $100 billion per annum was promised and was not realized. Okay, so now I want to move into what is the impact of climate change. And we all know them, but let me run through a few of them. Number one, extreme heat, drought, wildfires. Now, by the way, the elderly are most susceptible to unusual heat in their environments. Why? Because the, the night heat, where the, at night, when the body sort of relaxes and cools down, Apparently, the more elderly bodies can't regulate uh, their body temperatures if the heat remains. And I, I, I will tell you that in the little room that I'm sleeping in now, because I've got a guest in the main bedroom, uh, I felt some of that. It, it, it was incredibly hot. Heat waves since 2003 has killed 70,000 people. And you might remember there was a crisis in, in France, I think in 2013, 2014, where the heat was so great that a lot of elderly people died. Um, and running into to, to thousands and tens of thousands, and, and the French have, have done something to deal with it. So number two is droughts. Pro prolonged periods without, with insufficient H2O. Now, uh, Maybe some of you are interested in getting deeper into this whole story, and I can re recommend uh, a book. It's a difficult book by Mark Swilling, who's at, at Stellenbosch University, called The Age of Sustainability. And when he talks about water, he says that in 1900, we used 600 billion metric tons of water, 600 billion. In 2010, we used 4,500 billion meters to the third degree of water. In 2030, it is estimated that we will use between 6,350 and, say, 7,000 billion metric to the third degree. And he says that is 40% more water than we have on the planet. And one of the things that Swilling does well and some of his book uh, is incomprehensible to me, but one of the early chapters talks about the problems that we've got. And he, he has four categories, biomass, agricultural products and clothes, number one, fossil fuels, oil, gas, coal, construction materials, sand and cement, and ores, industrial metals. Now, why do you think China is so involved in Africa? Because Africa is the last continent which has a variety of incredibly important precious metals, earth metals. And China has been on this case for close on 20 years, ahead of the game of anybody else. So he's warning that in 1970, we used 22 billion tons of metals. 2010, 70 billion tons of metals. 2050, it'll be 150 billion tons, and we just don't have it. So we won't be able to use it for our cell phones, for our computers. We're going to have to come up with something else. And that is a positive thing that I should say at this moment, that the chances of us inventing ways of pushing back global warming are out there and people are doing amazing work. Some of it is crazy. I mean, there's one idea to have little 
um, orbiting mirrors that will send the sun, sun rays back to the sun, thousands or hundreds of thousands of them, there's an idea to put uh, iron into the sea to, to, to sustain um, the fauna and flora of the sea. Um, and some of these ideas are actually being used now. There, there, there's a university in the north of England that has already manufactured two boats, which when there is cloudy weather, will take seawater and spray it into the clouds in order to shield the, uh, the Arctic and the Antarctic. And they're doing it at the moment. So maybe, maybe uh, brilliant scientists will come up with ways of dealing with this. But we're going to run out of water. And one thing that I didn't know until recently is that the earth is running out of the cement, we, the, the sand we use to make cement, the sand we use. Now, I have been preaching for 30 years to my students that the next world war will be over water, but I had no idea that sand was a problem. And what Swilling suggests is that we are going to have to use wood instead of cement. Now, I spent 15 years in the United States, and as some of you may well know, the houses in America are usually built out of wood. And that's why when the hurricanes come along, they just flatten them. And that's very un-South African. But he is suggesting we are going to run out of cement. And we're going to have to use wood in exchange. Anyway, back to what I was, the impact of climate change. So we talked about extreme heat. We talked about droughts. Then come storms and floods. The past two decades have seen three quarter more insured losses related to floods and half as many fatalities as, uh, as before. Three times more of the land surface has been flooded compared to the period between 1986 and 2005. The whole monsoon story in Asia which is so critical to, to, to their agriculture and well-being. Now, apparently, there has been a tendency for monsoons to swerve away from where they were normally going. And that can be fatal for a country sort of, for instance, Vietnam, if they don't get their monsoon because the pattern is moving in a different direction. And, of course, we, we know about Katrina, uh, where there were only 1,800 deaths, I say only because Mitch in Central America in 1998 uh, left 1.5 million homeless, caused $6 billion damage, uh, far more serious. So that's to do with typhoon, cyclone, storms, floods. The fourth thing is our coasts. Now, a city like London, because of floods in the 50s, built the Them Thames Barrier. Now, the Thames Barrier was started to being built after the floods in 1953, and it took 31 years for it to be repaired. And the idea was that this barrier could with withstand one a one in 2,000 year flood. But since, since, since that time, it has been used 193 times already. I mention that because most of the cities that are on, on the sea line, particularly Bangladesh, but many others, and some of the islands that are already partially flooded, um, haven't got the money to build a seawall. Uh, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in the Netherlands, uh, 11 years, and boy, as people go, they, they know how to fight the sea and have done it uh, uh, for, for, forever. But that is another problem. So, you know, I look out of my window here in Mully Point, and there's a very nice little beach there, and particularly on the weekends, people go out and they walk on the rocks in ways that I can no longer do because I can't balance myself as well as I used to be able to do. That beach will be flooded if the icebergs fail especially in Antarctica, 
where there's a real danger, the, the biggest ice block, well, it has been seen to be fragmenting a little bit, cracks on the top and cracks on the bottom. If that were to, to disintegrate, the sea level would rise by eight meters. So very, very, very scary. The fifth point is agriculture. And uh, yeah, we got a little bit of a sense from the video of how agriculture uh, has had an impact. Uh, so uh, if, the, if the temperature in the world goes up by two degrees, as an example, Uganda, Ugandan coffee, they will, not, they will only be able to, to pr produce 10% of what they're producing now. And the, the sort of reverse of that is that they're starting to grow wine in northern Europe because it's getting warmer. And so we, we have seen in many parts of the world a change in how early spring comes. And I've got some statistics somewhere, uh, but I won't go into that. I want to move on now. There, there's an issue of ocean acidification, which, of course, impacts on uh, the fish that we depend on. Uh, and, and their well-being, uh, shellfish and the corals, et cetera, et cetera. But human health. So the, the, the biggest threat to human health is a lack of access to fresh water. I go back to Swilling and he says we're going to not be able to sustain the use of water that uh, we are uh, consuming at the moment uh, by 2050. There won't be enough water. There won't be water left. Um, Two billion people in the world today out of the eight billion that we have, so one quarter of the world population lives in water-stressed areas. By 2050, it will be one half of humanity that is water-stressed. So a very, very serious problem, which again, maybe the scientists can come up with ways. I mean, a country like Israel depends on, on, uh, on desalinated water for 70% of their water. So, you know, that might be the way to go. On the issue, the last issue I've got here is food security. The feeling is that we could feed, feed 9 billion people. The problem is, how is it going to be brought to the people that need it who don't have money? What are we going to do about that? So, not very good news, uh, but that, that is a, a summary uh, of, 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 uh, of, of what I've got to tell you. Uh, and so we've got to move to, uh, I, I think now we should look at the, the video from The Economist, if you don't mind, Derek, to give you a sense of how it is for people in these Three areas. Three degrees. It can be the difference between snow and sleet, wearing a jacket or not. In your day-to-day -day life, it may not seem significant, but three degrees of global warming would be catastrophic. Heat waves, droughts, extreme precipitation, even fire. Three degrees of warming is really disastrous. The scary thing is the world is well on its way there. Since the Industrial Revolution, the Earth has warmed between 1.1 and 1.3 degrees Celsius. This is a problem that babies you pass in the street will have to live with. Children born today are up to seven times more likely to face extreme weather than their grandparents. If global temperatures do rise by three degrees, what would their world look like? Rising sea levels, desertification. Hollywood has always enjoyed imagining the end of the world. While blockbusters like this are clearly fiction, this film will show the scenario we all face unless more drastic measures are taken to stop burning fossil fuels. In some parts of the world, the effects of inaction are already clear. The slums of Bangladesh's capital are filling up with climate migrants. Minara comes from Bola district, an area in southern Bangladesh. There, like many other parts of the country, 
Rivers swollen by heavier rain and melting Himalayan glaciers are washing away people's homes. Many, like her, have lost everything. One point one to one point three degrees of global warming has already transformed Minara's life. It's one of the reasons why so many migrants like her are moving to the city each year, nearly four hundred thousand, according to the last estimate. And climate models show there could be much worse to come. Climate scientist Yuri Rogolis spent the last 10 years modeling future climate scenarios for the United Nations. The models we use to carry out this exercise really represent the state of the art of our current knowledge of climate change and where we are heading. Yuri's projections use data collected by hundreds of scientists around the world. Here, this is the three degree level, and so there is uh, at least a one in four chance that under current policies we would hit three degrees by the end of the century. This is just one of the scenarios Yuri looks at. Another one imagines that all policy promises are kept. The most optimistic assumes that all promises have been kept and net zero targets are met. Where our best estimate ends up around two degrees at the end of the century, there is still a one in 20 chance that we end up with three degrees instead. One wouldn't be entering a plane if there is a one in 20 chance that the plane will crash. A rise of three degrees would affect everyone. Even wealthy cities and rich countries wouldn't be immune to the consequences. European capitals like Paris and Berlin would bake under more extreme heat waves. Frequent storm surges in New York could turn parts of the city desolate. In many ways, cities um, magnify, intensify climate events. Cities are hotter than the places around them. They tend to be more um, vulnerable to flooding, and you can get a really bad event in a city in a way that you can't in the countryside. And because of their denser populations, okay, Derek, disasters in a city off. affect far more people. OK. Not very nice, but you can you can get the full video. It's well done. So now I'm going to, to, to mention one thing. There's a guy called George Mombiat who wrote a book called This Can't Be Happening. Now, he raises a point, and there's several people that I've read who, who raised the point, talking about growth and consumerism versus trying to control climate change and greenhouse gases. Now, in the many, many UN conferences about climate change, they have never been allowed to or never been inclined to talk about the way that we run our societies. In other words, the industrialized global economy that we have today, um, which has been so great for us, it has certainly freed billions of people from poverty but we are consuming too much. And his argument is that we are not linking a change in climate, doing something about climate, to the way that we consume, the amount that we consume, the way we produce what we produce, the way that we use energy. And so the argument is that we've got to move into something which they call degrowth, degrowth that we are going to say we can no longer grow at the rate that we have been growing. We've got to stop doing this. We've got to consume less. And in one article that I, I read, they said, think about the 1970s when we didn't have all these fancy, this fancy technology around us. Um, when our kids were playing out in the streets and had to be dragged into the house when the sun set, it wasn't a bad life. We lived pretty well. 
why not go back to that kind of lifestyle? Because that would save a tremendous amount of energy. So there's a whole story there about capitalism and climate. But now I want to end up with the, some of the solutions. So with the sea rise, we can move homes back from the sea. We can relocate agriculture. We can develop aquaculture. We can build walls, even though in London it took them 30 years to build a wall. Uh, we know that Jakarta is sinking. I just read in the news that uh, the, the name of the new capital city, because it's been uh, sinking, in Holland, where I live, uh, in the northern part of Holland, for many, many decades, they've been taking gas from, 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 from underneath. And then suddenly they noticed that houses were subsiding, so they had to stop doing it. And now they're importing gas from, from Russia, like most of Western Europe, and all that that entails, if we're thinking in these days about Ukraine. Okay, so what else can we do? Solar power, biofuels, wind power. Now, I, I had a, a colleague who, who came to a lecture of, me, of mine and he said, hey, wait a minute, these wind turbines which you're talking about, they use 80 gallons of oil as a lubricant. And they use synthetic oil based on crude, 12,000 gallons of it. That oil needs to be replaced every year. 380,000 turbines would be needed to power a city the size of New York. That's 304,000 gallons of refined oil for just one city. Where are we going to get the oil from, he says. Where? From the oil fairies. And then how eco-friendly is wind energy? 150 turbines needs 225 acres. Uh, in order to power a city the size of New York, you'd need 57,000 acres. And then how are you going to dispose about the wind turbines after 20 years? Because of these huge blades that are now being buried, can they be refurbished, reduced, repurposed, et cetera, et cetera. So there's another story. If we're going to have electric cars, where is the electricity going to come from? How are we going? Are we going to further endanger the planet by by causing carbon dioxide, or is there going to be another way? There's talk about wave and tidal power because the waves go when the wind stops, so the waves are constant. And you know, for South Africa with our coastline, wave and tidal power could be amazing, although the technology is not great. There's hydro energy. 5% of the world's energy uh, uh, is, is coming from hydro energy now. Geothermal energy, nuclear energy. And, you know, we, Kuberg is just down the road here and they, they're repurposing it. Normally, after 40 years, you want to close down your, your, uh, your nuclear station, but they, they believe that they can give it another life. Um, but, of course, the problem is what do you do with uh, the uranium? The depleted uranium and decommissioning a, a nuclear station takes a long, long time. Their thoughts of carbon capture and storage, capturing the carbon and putting it into the sea or burying it on the land uh, and so on and so forth. Now, one of the problems is that there are tremendous subsidies for fossil fuel. The U.S. spends $81 billion per annum protecting oil supplies. The IMF says that globally, $5.2 trillion per annum is used to support fossil fuels. Now, we know that in our own country. That's what Gwen Gwedi Mantashe is upset about. We should be supporting this searching for fossil fuels. But what the scientists are saying to us is stop using fossil fuels. Leave that very valuable stuff right where it is in the earth. Don't take any more at all as soon as possible. Then there's the issue of reforestation. So we saw that COP26 talked about cutting, for, uh, the, the cutting down of forests by 30%. And I have said to my U3A members who were at the course, what can we do? I think the most important thing we could do is perhaps to find a way to grow more trees because trees are so important in stabilizing the soil, preventing soil erosion, preventing flooding. And then people said to me, 
if you if you plant trees they'll be stolen we live in south africa right everything is stolen okay so i'm going to stop there and and end with that amazing young woman greta thunberg and then i'll be open to your questions so uh, derek please give us greta thunberg we'll only listen to a short amount of a year greta. and a half ago i didn't speak to anyone unless i really had to but then I found a reason to speak. Since then, I've given many speeches and learned that when you talk in public, you should start with something personal or emotional to get everyone's attention. Say things like, our house is on fire, I want you to panic, or how dare you. But today I will not do that, because then those phrases are all that people focus on. They don't remember the facts, the very reason why I say those things in the first place. We no longer have time to leave out the science. For about a year, I have been constantly talking about our rapidly declining carbon budgets over and over again. But since that is still being ignored, I will just keep repeating it. In chapter 2, on page 108 in the SR 1.5 IPCC report that came out last year, it says that if we are to have a 67% chance of limiting the global temperature rise to below 1.5 degrees Celsius, we had on January 1st, 2018, 420 gigatons of CO2 left to emit in that budget. And of course, that number is much lower today as we emit about 42 gigatons of CO2 every year, including land use. With today's emissions levels, that remaining budget will be gone within about eight years. These numbers aren't anyone's opinions or political views. This is the current best available science. Though many scientists suggest these figures are too moderate, these are the ones that have been accepted through the IPCC. And please note that these figures are global and therefore do not say anything about the aspect of equity, which is absolutely essential to make the Paris Agreement work on a global scale. That means that richer countries need to do their fair share and get down to real zero emissions much faster and then help poorer countries do the same so people in less fortunate parts of the world can raise their living standards. These numbers also don't include most feedback loops, non-linear tipping points, or additional warming hidden by toxic air pollution. Most models assume, however, that future generations will somehow be able to suck hundreds of billions of tons of CO2 out of the air with technologies that do not exist in the scale required and maybe never will. The approximate 67% chance budget is the one with the highest odds given by the IPCC. And now we have less than 340 gigatons of CO2 left to emit in that budget to share fairly. And why is it so important to stay below 1.5 degrees? Because even at one degree, people are dying from the climate crisis. Because that is what the United Science calls for to avoid destabilizing the climate so that we have the best possible chance to avoid setting off irreversible chain reactions, such as melting glaciers, polar hey, ice, and thawing Arctic. Can we stop? I hate to stop her because she, and, and this will be forward to you if you forward to you if you want want to. So, bottom line is, it's really not the politicians that are going to do it. It's not the industrial companies and multinationals that are going to do it. They've got too much to lose. It's going to be pressure from civil society, from you and me, and we can do it in our own lives to a very limited extent. We can talk to our friends about it, and we can organize, 
as was done with Shell a, a couple of months ago. So I leave you with this message. History knocked on your door. Did you answer? And now for your questions. Oh, the swerving away. So that's a little bit like what I was saying, Francis, uh, in regards to the monsoon. I wasn't aware of this, um, but uh, that would be something new that's happening, and that's not good for people who want rain. Thank you. Next question. Have we got any other questions? Maybe not. Oh, that was the last question. Okay, so then I've got a few more minutes to tell you some, hopefully not all bad news, some, some good news. Um, let me find my notes on uh, solutions. I think, I think that uh, there's a word that I came across. Oh, he has a question. What are the top three things that we as individuals can do? Sure. Look, I think we've all started this process of recycling, which is very developed. When I was in Europe, there was a different plastic bin for almost everything, glass in one, paper, plastic, cardboard, um, I do that, and I, I introduced it to Pont de Garde here in Mully Point when I arrived here 11 years ago. And so every Thursday they pick up our, our, our recycling materials, and that's important because that can be reworked and reused. Uh, similarly, we can think – look, I, I think one of the most impressive things that I've experienced in my time in Cape Town over the last 11 years was the water crisis of two, three years ago. Cape Towners of every stripe, from the rich to the poor, saved 50% of their water usage. So we got used to doing a two-minute shower and then a one-and-a-half-minute shower, and, and friends of mine would have, have a big barrel in the shower that they would use for other purposes, and some of them still do it, uh, which is a bit crazy. But uh, we can do that kind of thing. We can be more cautious about how much water we use, how much electricity we use, because we heard today we thought we might not be able to give the stock today because of load shedding, which kicked in at 11 o'clock in South, in South Africa and did not affect our region until my, my particular region until 8 o'clock tonight, which is Netflix time. But are we using too much energy watching Netflix and our, our computers and our videos and, and, and all the stuff that also uses energy? So we have to become more conscious about what we use and what we eat. So a friend of mine uh, in, in the United States, or actually it was my son, he said, Dad, we've decided we'll only eat meat on the weekends. Well, that is a big deal for that boy because he loves his steak. And I think that many of the people that I know in my community here are cutting back on, the, uh, on eating meat and, and looking for alternatives. And those alternatives are being invented. I don't understand why the vegetarian option in the supermarket is more expensive than the meat option, but maybe that'll change over time. So that's that's a thought. Look, I would say that the most important thing is we've got to stop consuming as much as we have been. We've got to think twice about getting the fanciest, newest coffee machine or, I don't know, uh, washing machine or whatever it is air conditioner which i you know i've started thinking this last two weeks three weeks maybe i need an air conditioner here i know some of my fellow uh flat flat mates around uh, down the corridor have got uh, air conditioners which of course use a lot of energy so any other thoughts there and if not uh, what else can I tell you? I've got other stuff that I can tell you. 
Oh, God. So th this guy swilling, who I can... Oh, he has a question. Should the global focus not shift towards, uh, um, I suppose, cutting the population, containing the population? Okay, Johan. Okay, that that is a problem. And the only answer to that is the, the miraculous change in uh, bringing the poor out of poverty in China. So something like 600 million people. Is that right? Because they've got 1.3 billion people. So 600 million of those people over the last two decades have be, been brought out of poverty. Why is that a good thing? Because people who, who come into the middle class start figuring out what they're going to do for their children. And Mao's China, which only allowed one child, because he was aware of pop population explosion and he was worried by it, has now been subsequently been changed to two, two children per family. And now China, which does not want to bring in migrants to do the work, like Japan, they, they don't trust the pollution, the pollution of their culture, you could say, or the diminution of their culture, um, those people will, will, will not have as many children and will be more cautious about where the money goes. And so once you have the whole, if the whole world could become middle class tomorrow or in the next 20 years, we would stop having that many children and the population would stabilize. The, the aim is to stabilize at 9 billion which is a lot because 9 billion would be a real tax on, 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 uh, on the planet. We're already using more than, some people say 2.3 planets. The amount that we're consuming is more than the one planet Earth can sustain. And then, of course, we have some of our billionaires who have decided, I'm getting out of here. This is bad news. Maybe they know more than I know or than we know, and they're saying, I'm heading for another planet, and that's where we should go. We should, we should take some of our billions of people to another planet out there, and that is a fascinating option. I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime, and maybe not in yours, maybe in our children's, but it's really our children. You know, when, when I came up with a title, Are We Le Reaching the End of the Road?, it occurred to me that uh, we are indeed, we are in trouble. We are in serious trouble. But now I'm going to hand back to Richard and he's going to say goodbye to, to you and to me. And it's been wonderful meeting you. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Saransky, giving us some of your time today for such an informative, interesting talk and certainly thought provoking. I'm sure many people will now be rethinking lifestyle and attitudes towards global warming. Please join us again on our usual first Wednesday of the month, this being the 2nd of March at 10 a.m., when the speaker will be Professor Anwar Maul, who you will recall spoke to us last year about the gut part of our human digestion. So this part, it will be more of our system. An advanced advice is that we are hoping to be able and are planning to return to our monthly Strand Town Hall meetings from Wednesday the 6th of April. But more news of that later, so keep an eye on your email inbox. Until then, goodbye from U3A Helderberg.